So hello and welcome everyone to this, uh, the EES Tuesday Spotlight for December 2023. Uh, this marks the end of our uh, Traversing the Nile theme, which has been exploring travel, trade and exchange across the Nile Valley. It also marks our final public event of uh, the year. So thank you if you're joining us uh, or catching up on YouTube possibly in the new year. Um, but yeah, it's been a brilliant uh, six months of uh, exploring this theme and do go check out our YouTube playlist to watch other YouTube lectures on this topic. But let's get back to today. Uh, I'm thrilled to uh, introduce today's lecture. So our title today is uh, Blueprints for Bureaucracy, How the Egyptian Government Designed Settlements in the Desert to Oversee Amethyst Mining. And our speaker with us today uh, very kindly is joining us from very early on in the morning over in the US. <laughs> uh, Dr. Kate Lisker, thank you for joining us. Uh, so she is the Benson and Pamela Hera Fellow in Egyptology and Professor of History at California State University, San Bernardino. Since 2014, she has directed the Wadi al Hudi expedition to the Eastern Desert, along with Brian Kramer and Meredith Brand. Uh, so from uh, 2012 to 2015, she was a Cotson Fellow, a member of the Society of Fellows at Princeton University. Uh, she specializes in studies of Egyptian Nubian relations, border zones, and the Egyptian administration. For more information about uh, their archeological work, please visit the Wadi El Hudi website, which I'll put in either the Zoom chat or the YouTube description. So thank you very much, Kate, for joining us. Uh, please do share your screen for your brilliant presentation today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be able to share all of this with you. Um, and I'm I'm thrilled to be able to you know be part of the travel and exchange theme also um, for the EES today. Uh, so yeah, um, I just want you to think for a minute. You know, mentally think about the world. Um, wait, can you see all the? You can see the slides, right? Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Just for a moment, I want you to imagine a world without the color purple in it because that's really what ancient Egypt was like before the Middle Kingdom. They didn't really have purple. There were a couple of uh, a couple of pieces of amethyst that was known, but it was few and far between and extraordinarily rare. And most of our purple today is made from synthetic dyes um, or other synthetic materials. And so when the ancient Egyptians found a source of amethyst around 2000 BCE, at the beginning of the Middle Kingdom, this introduced a whole new color into their world. And they kind of went crazy to go and, and gather it. Uh, immediately, the Egyptian government was sending off expeditions uh, to gather amethyst and to bring it back to uh, put in the royal treasury of the pharaoh and then also to dole out as beautiful pieces of jewelry to members of the elite class of the princesses and at that type and it it really did you know change their mental view of the world in many ways now after they had discovered amethyst at wadi el hudi um and they started sending out expeditions they have been doing these types of things for the better part of 800 years at this point. They had already built the pyramids of Giza. They had sent expeditions into the Sinai, uh, into the Eastern Desert already. And, and so like they knew how to run these larger types of ex expeditions. This was just a new area. And Wadi El Hudi is east of Aswan. Um, it is, in fact, not just one place. It is, in fact, a large archaeological region that um, every time we go out, we find new archaeological sites. I believe we're over about 54 archaeological sites at this point. Um, and it seems like every season that we, we go out and we find more. Um, and they all kind of work together over this 100 square kilometer area. Um, so it's really a, a quite large region. Um, and the Egyptians who started these expeditions even built a road uh, where they laid stones in lines for 
essentially from Wadi al Hudi the entire way back to Aswan. So you might have caravan leaders at the beginning, but after a certain point, as long as people pointed you towards the road and you walked for a day or two, you would essentially get there. Um, so, it, so it's quite an exciting place for people to go out and see. Now, geologically, Wadi al Hudi is a fascinating place. This is a place where the Precambrian basement of metamorphic gneiss nice mashes with much younger uh, Nubian sandstones. So if you, if you don't know geology like me, essentially what happens is a bunch of old rocks and a bunch of young rocks get together, smash together, and in that mixing, it creates minerals. So you have a lot of amethyst, but you also have other minerals too, like uh, mica, a barite, there is some gold that was discovered later um, and many, many other things that are coming out in this particular area. Um, but it also means that each mountainside and each valley is geologically different. Some areas are incredibly spiky where other places are flat and sandy. Um, and it it changes within you know several meters of each other. Uh, and it's a landscape where you can both get your car stuck in the sand and also um, you know, pop your car's tire on the same day, <laughs> speaking from experience. Um, but it, it really is a diverse type of desert landscape in many capacities. Now, this area, um, so once they found uh, amethyst in this area, the ancient Egyptians started to explore explore the whole area. Some sites are quite small, but other sites can actually be really, really big. So sites four, five, and nine are enormous. They are all places where you have massive, um, massive mines that are, you know, the size of football fields, and you have purposeful settlements built next to the mines to actually facilitate the mining process in general. Um, and if they have, if these sites haven't been, you know, destroyed in modern times, they're actually still incredibly well preserved. It's almost like walking into a time capsule in the ancient world. Um, walls still often stand to their original heights, uh, sometimes as high as two meters, um, with with little destruction. Uh, and also, the miners in the area. Um, would, uh, wouldn't would always clean up after themselves. I mean, why should you? You're coming out to do a temporary mining expedition. So oftentimes they leave archaeological trash in the same spaces that they use them. And because of the geology, a lot of that trash is not covered with sand unless if it's you know up against a wall or, or something like that that catches the sand so it's fantastic because as you walk around you can actually see the first level of archaeology on the ground in many ways and you can start to analyze the site with this depth that um you just from walking around and from surveying that you don't get in a lot of the nile valley sites and it's given us a tremendous understanding of of what is out there um, and so, as I mentioned, there are three large sites, and they were essentially founded at the beginning of the uh, Middle Kingdom. So Site 5 was founded first. Uh, it was uh, probably founded by Montuhotep IV, the last king of the 11th dynasty, around um, around 2000. But then just two kings later, Sinwazir I likely founded Site 9, and they're only about a kilometer away from each other. Um, and then slightly after that, we don't really know, maybe Sinwaz with the third, maybe slightly earlier, um, we have the founding of Site 4. And as each of these places was um, discovered to have a large amethyst vein in them, um, it doesn't mean closing down the other zones. What this means is running a larger network. So even once Site 4 was started, they were still simultaneously mining at Site 9 and Site 5, and the, and the sites could actually work together as a unit, and the people would work together as a unit in these cases. Um, now, we also learn a lot about Wadi El Hudi from Lots and lots and lots of inscriptions. Uh, we we have some 280 inscriptions from Site 5 and, and Site 9 and Site 4 at this point. Um, in the 1930s, about 
40 stele were taken out of Wadi El Hudi and brought to the Aswan Museum. Uh, and so we don't really know exactly where they were from in the landscape, um, but one of our goals is to try to figure out exactly where these stele had originally been located too. Um, now site five is quite spectacular because you have these very, very large boulders and they're actually like inscribed onto the boulders in the landscape. I know it's a little hard to see, but there are about five or six inscriptions just directly in front of you on these, these rocks. And you really get this fantastic understanding of how text works with the landscape, how an inscription is supposed to be in the place to comment on the space that it's in. And so we're able to do a lot of that. But these ins inscriptions also give us really a lot of details about, um, about how the projects are run, right? Um, we know that uh, the king essentially sent expeditions out to get amethyst. We know that they're temporary expeditions that stay for a couple months, if not longer. Sometimes they list the laborers who go. Um, oftentimes we have teams of adding up to over 1,500 people participating in these, in these uh, separate inscriptions. Uh, we know that there were both Egyptian laborers, but then Nubian laborers mixed in too. And sometimes the laborers even brought their own stuff with them. Um, so there's a lot of really exciting information that comes out of these. Um, and one of the inscriptions in particular, inscription number four, uh, actually says what they were doing and how much amethyst they got. It says that they were working in the desert for a full year. And in that time, they basically brought in 150 hecat of amethyst. So that's, you know, something like 280 liters. So you have to imagine, you know, uh, 1,000, 1,500 people working for a full year for enough amethyst that fits into, you know, a closet. <laughs> um, but that was considered worth it in what they were doing because this was so precious because it was bringing this new, exciting color into their lives. Uh, we also see, in addition to the the inscriptions telling us they were mining. Of course, we have tons and tons and tons of evidence for mining. Um, so so uh, this is site five, and you can see the mine in the lower front corner, but directly over the spoil heaps on either side, you also get areas where they are refining the amethyst too. Um, so a lot of times you see things like hammer stones, uh, as you see in the upper left corner, and then they are breaking the quartz off of the amethyst. Uh, to actually extract the purple pieces or, you know, other parts of the rock matrix to get off the amethyst in this particular cases. And the first scale of mining would occur directly next to the mine, and they would try to actually refine it and make the pieces smaller and smaller. But they also have to carry this stuff back to the Nile Valley, so you don't want to take extra stuff with you. Um, and so there were other places of refinement within the landscape too. Now site five is an incredibly interesting place because it is one of the few settlements uh, of Egyptian history that actually takes the shape of the hill it's on. And, and the organization of the site uses the boulders and the natural spaces of the hill. But at site five, you can actually see how they are further refining amethyst. So as they bring the amethyst out of the large mine, they then take it into this front room right at the front of site five, where you get further refinement of amethyst. Notice how there's walls around it, how people could watch you in this particular case. But then what's really strange is as you go up into the site, essentially you have to walk up a steep hill for about five minutes. You get to a, a tiny, tiny room at the top that is, you know, it's just simply like four meters by two meters long. It is, it's very small. And this room is absolutely chocked full of amethyst debris as well. So it really it, it it really seems intentional that they were taking these pieces of raw amethyst, carrying it the whole way to the top of the hill, and then further refining it up at that space. And the top of the hill is actually an incredibly protected area. It's an area where it is guarded and not everybody was allowed in. There's really only two paths in. Um, and 
in those cases, both of the paths are effectively overseen by guard posts. So people could watch as they go in and they go out. Plus, you have not just the exterior wall on the outside of the settlement, you also have this very strange interior wall that actively separates the housing areas from essentially the administrative areas. So you can really see direct administrative control over the amethyst mining process and the refining process, where they are really trying to gather every single piece of purple that exists. Um, and this particular area is also very interesting because not only is it is it guarded for the amethyst, but the other artifact that is up there in mass are what are known as Marl Sea Zeers. So these are very large water jars made out of a specific type of clay that has to be imported from the northern part of Egypt. Um, essentially, this is where they kept their water. And so water was perhaps the most important and the most fought or the most guarded element out in the desert. Um, and you can actually see that the the administration is actually keeping track of their water too in the same area that they are keeping track of the amethyst. So they're really controlling these two elements coming in and coming out. Um, as we move further south to site nine, you can also see a lot of other patterns that arise at this time. So site nine has a giant mine, uh, as you see on the right hand side, but it is built directly onto the wadi floor. So it does not take the shape of the hillside and it's essentially a flat area. So they could design it the way that they wanted to. Um, and the design of Site 9 is actually quite interesting. Um, when you look at the stones, you can kind of see that they have both pinkish stones and darker stones in the wall. The pinkish stones are stones that come as debris from the mining process. So they are part of the spoil of the mine. The darker stones are large stones that have been left on the surface. But notice that these are integrated into the walls in full, which means that they found the mine first, they started mining it first, they realized how awesome it was, and then they built the settlement to help support them, um, because the entire structure uses the spoil from the mine too. Now, a lot of people in the past have talked about Site 9 as being similar to ancient Egyptian fortresses that are on Lower Nubia. Um, so at the same time, Sinwazir I and Sinwazir III are building these enormous fortresses on the Nile Valley, um, or sorry, in the Nile Valley between Egypt and Nubia. Um, and there are similar architectural elements in them. Um, these things are really cool. As you can see on the left-hand side, you have buttresses with arrow loops coming out of it um, so that they could, you know, fight off the, the Nubians uh, supposedly that are attacking. Um, and a lot of people have called Site 9 a fortress in the past, in part because we have these very strange holes through the walls. And they're not very high. They're only about a meter off the ground. Um, and that's that's halfway up a two meter high wall. So they're, they're, these walls are nowhere near the same size that you get in Lower Nubia. Um, but we have these purposefully built holes through the wall that go about a, a meter long and they have a purposeful lintel and side wall, uh, sides to them, but they also have jagged rocks uh, up and down through them as well. And they kind of go around the entire exterior. In fact, the places where you don't see the little arrows in the, or the little triangles in the plan noting a loop are actually places where the wall has collapsed in many cases. So they pr were probably originally more of them also. Um, but I don't think that these uh, that these holes were arrow loops to shoot arrows out of because, you know, they're so low to the ground, archers would have to kneel through them. Plus, they are long and narrow. They don't flare open like we have at Buhen and other places. So you're only shooting, you know, like a 10 degree area. And honestly, for able bodied 20 year old miners or people that work there, just putting your foot in the arrow loop and standing and shooting over the wall would be so much more effective than trying to shoot through these things. So they they had to have had a different 
purpose. But at the same time, you can still see so many other architectural similarities between Site 9 and the Lower Nubian Fortresses too, besides just these holes in the wall. Um, so for instance, all of these places have some sort of like administrative building where they are better built and definitely is kind of the seat of power in these particular cases. Another element is a lot of times they have these paths around the edges of the settlements or between the settlements or between the um the exterior walls and the larger buildings on the inside. This kind of works as like a protective few meters so people can't just jump over the walls and get into the spaces that they need. Um, so purposefully designed about the same time. You also have what seems to be these types of granaries uh, in Lower Nubia, where you have these square rooms that often do not have doors in them uh, and would have to be entered from the top. And we have a very similar area in the northern part of uh, the east side or area B in this particular case where we have square rooms and some of them have no doors at all uh, and they kind of have a courtyard area in the front so it makes us think that that is some sort of storage area um, so you can see these architectural similarities as far as the actual like layout goes but when you start to look at things like the method from which it was built, you don't see similarities with Buhen or, or with Shelfback or these other fortresses. Instead, you see similarities with a Nubian settlement known as Wadi es Sabua, um, which is a, one of our only uh, C group Nubian settlements that is also contemporary. But notice how on the left-hand side, all of the stones are stacked on angles almost purposely in this dry stone architectural uh, style. Similarly, on the right hand side, you have a lot of um, small kind of like circular buildings, too. So we see a couple of similarities there. But the other big similarity is that at Wadi es Sabua, there are also purposeful holes built through the walls that look exactly like ours. They have lintels, they have these jagged little corridors, um, and they're really only like halfway up on a two meter high area. So uh, th these, these seem to be, so what we're seeing at Site 9 is really interesting because it looks like it was designed by the Egyptians, but at the same time, it, parts of it might've been built by Nubians. And so uh, the way that I imagine it is that the administrators looked at their workforce and they gave them a plan sketched onto a little ostracon, like here, build me this, right? About this size. But they didn't really care like what type of techniques were used to build the individual walls because they were getting the settlement that they wanted and needed. Um, but they probably did want these holes to be able to see through the walls. And I, I envision them much more as windows than anything else. Um, so the large area, area A, seems to be the headquarters of where the administration or storage in this particular area was. Um, you can see that they are expanding it as they come out in different times. So you have an original square that was built, and then you have an extension on the north side. Um, but the, the room at the back center is actually quite interesting. Its walls are thicker and taller than anywhere else in the entire settlement. Um, and what's really cool is that the dry stone architecture um, isn't just the large stones, but somebody went through the difficulty of like putting tiny stones into the gaps to really like block out any light at all and plug everything else. Uh, so this room, I would assume, uh, is perhaps like the central big storage area um, that they definitely wanted to have protected over anything else in the in the settlement. You can also see that all the other rooms are built onto this one. So this one was built first, too. It, it's quite interesting. Um, but then when we look at the eastern side of Site 9, you can also see lots of expansions, too. So we did try to excavate parts of uh, what's known as Area B, um, and I showed you that they are architecturally similar to 
um, storage areas or granaries in the fortresses. So I thought, oh, perhaps we could have some sort of storage area. I don't necessarily think it's uh, it's a granary because granaries need like plaster actually put on the walls or something on the actual walls so that it keeps the grain dry. But it's still the same organization and storage that you get in in storage areas. Um, and so we looked at a uh, part of the area in the front, uh, hoping that this is where the scribes hang, hung out and where that they would, you know, leave a lot of their seal impressions, uh, showing their administration. And unfortunately, that is not what we found. <laughs> what we found when we went down is that um, underneath the area walls, you actually have lots and lots of areas for cooking outside. Uh, lots of little teeny hearths, lots of little teeny building things. But all of those are at a much lower depth, too. And in fact, the entire eastern side was an expansion onto the standard area in the first place. So what I think was happening was before this expansion took place, they were actually cooking outside of the, the walls. But then after this extension took place, then we have the reuse of this space. Um, but they're still, you know, going in and out of this area. They're still walking through the East Gate in many ways. You can see that because the tiny pieces of pottery that are essentially everywhere are particularly small along the paths where they walked because they would have stepped on them more. Um, whereas lots of other places of Site 9, they're physically larger too. Um, so it begs the question, you know, Site 5 has over 100 inscriptions that are in place, like where are the inscriptions at site nine, right? Site five has all of these large boulders where you could carve onto them directly, but site nine doesn't. It's a it's dry stones built directly in the wadi. So what we can imagine though, is that, you know, perhaps they brought in stele. So stele are, are rocks that they write inscriptions on, but also ones that are mildly portable, uh, although sometimes very heavy. Um, and we actually, I, I believe, discovered some of these uh, in our second season. So if you look at Site 9 at the top, 150 meters south of Site 9, we have a rock outcrop. And on top of that rock outcrop, which is the closest rock outcrop to the site, um, there were three stelae that were found on, uh, on top of the rock outcrop. And two of them date to year 28 of Sinwazrit the first. So these are in direct association with Site 9. Um, plus, what you end up getting is you have what are known as these you know, stele emplacements. They're essentially large circles that once held the stele in place. So imagine this. You want a rock to stand up. How do you do that? Well, you put other rocks and dirt around the base. And what you get after the stele are gone are just like these circles with rocks and dirt that are left over. Uh, once we started looking for these types of stele emplacements, um, spaces where that could have once held stele, they're actually all over the place, especially along the exterior wall of Site 9, both to the north, which is facing Site 5, but then also to the south, which is facing that outcrop. Um, and so it seems like people, there probably had been stele placed in these places and that they had been right along the wall lines. But a lot of them uh, were likely taken to the Aswan Museum in the 30s or disappeared along other means as well. Um, and so looking at looking at Wadi El Hudi uh, and going back to these inscriptions, seeing the archaeology, but then also looking at the inscriptions, it really begs the question as to like how they did all of this. Because, you know, inscription six, which has been, you know, published since 1952 um, by Ahmed Fekri and then later by Ashraf Sadak, shows us that, you know, up to 1,500 people were part of these expeditions. But when you look at these settlements, they couldn't fit 1,500 people in them. I mean, Site 5 probably has about 50 rooms. So at most, even if they're chock full, what is that, like 300 people or so? Um, and Site 9 too, again, unless if you're standing shoulder to shoulder, is not large enough to hold 1,500 people. But the way that I envision this now, understanding the whole landscape, is that you have multiple sites running at the same time. So this is probably an accounting of 
all the people in all the places. Simultaneously, these people way out in the desert need to eat, they need to drink water, um, and they need to be supplied. So you also have to account for a supply line of donkeys going back and forth to Aswan, I don't know, daily, every two days, every three days, to be able to bring them what they need. So when you start to think of the landscape as a whole, and the landscape as a journey, and the landscape as as an, a larger expedition, you can kind of see this number coming to fruition with all of these people traveling. And the thing that gets me every time is that this was worth it. You know, getting your closet full of amethyst by the end of the year was worth all of this effort, all of this organization to bring people out into the desert. So thank you so much for listening today. And I'd be thrilled to answer any of your questions. Um, please check out our website, wadielhudi.com. We have several articles. And, um, you know, if you'd like to donate to the project, you can do that too. Um, so thanks so much for having me today. Dr. Kate Liska, thank you so much for such a fascinating discussion and presentation. Um, yeah, I, I, I love the way you opened the event. Can you imagine a world without purple? I don't think I can. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And we wear so much of it today. Like, it's just, it seems such a staple. And yet, you know, their whole perspective is different. So, yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. And I, I, it was very helpful to see those comparisons with, with Wadi El Hudi and other Egyptian sites like Uhen and, and things. But the actual links with Nubian architecture, su such a fascinating sort of collaboration between the two cultures there. Yeah, it really is a, a multicultural space. We are on a border zone, and I didn't get to talk about any of this, but you have to understand there are loads of pastoral nomads in the area too. There's also lots of travelers going through the area, trying to get out to the Red Sea and going south. And so this is not just a place where, you know, the expeditions went out, found things, and it was empty the rest of the time. It's We've actually discovered loads of evidence for people moving through the entire landscape through most of um, their their periods in time yeah well I think on that note it's a perfect way to end our theme of exchange <laughs> with it, within the Nile Valley and things and so what's left for me to say is a massive thank you to Dr Kate Liska especially for getting up extremely early <laughs> with, with the time zones to present for us today thank you so much and of course other people echoing those thanks in the chat and uh, yeah Thank you very much all for joining us as well, whether you're here in the Zoom room with us or whether you're watching back on YouTube. I'd just like to take this opportunity to say that we are only able to present these lectures for you for free because of the support of our members. If you are interested in EAS membership, do please do visit our brand new website that's only launched last month. Uh, and uh, if you join us uh, now, then you can get a membership that lasts until March 2025. So you get a few months free. <laughs> So, so please do check that out and thank you for your support if you're already a member or a supporter. So once again, thank you so much, Kate. And uh, we'll thank you for having me. This was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. It's It's been an honor to hear so much about Wadi El Hudi. And yes, as uh, I put the link somewhere, but uh, it's also on the website. Please do visit their website to find out even more. So yeah, we'll follow up with your research and answering some of those questions. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> So yeah, thank you all and we will hopefully see you in the new year. Bye everyone. Bye.